about to get a great big treat as you welcome on stage the legendary poet raconteur he's been everywhere he's done everything he's a pop star and he is still the coolest man in Glastonbury ladies and gentlemen John Cooper Clark Yeah, thanks a lot. Well, I'll tell you, uh, anybody that's ever seen me before, either in photographic form or on the television, probably the television, I'm sick of the side of myself. <laughs> anybody that's ever seen me before will have noted that uh, I've been piling my pounds on lately. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for not pointing that out. Back on the drugs, you fuck. I know how bad it is. I fell downstairs last Monday, the wife thought EastEnders had finished early. <laughs> Thanks for not pointing it out. But there's a reason for this. The reason is since I stopped taking narcotics. Now I can't go back to Manchester, the place of my birth, where narcotic use is uh, compulsory. <laughs> it's always the same story. I see somebody I know it's. Hey, Dr. Clark, get back on drugs, you fat fuck. <laughs> They're not being helpful, frankly. <laughs> to the point where I wrote a poem about it, and this one's called, spookily enough, get back on drugs, you fat fuck. <laughs> when I go back to Longridge Park, does anybody wish me good luck? All they say is, hey, Dr. Clark, uh, get back on drugs, you fat fuck. Get back on drugs, you fat bastard. Get back on drugs, you fat fuck. We only like you when you're plastered. Get back on drugs, you fat fuck. They say I'm piling on the pounds, but that ain't the only reason that I suck. Put the donut down and get back on drugs, you fat fuck. Get back on drugs, you fat degenerate. Get back on them, you schmuck. You're the size of a minor emirate. You were good once, but I don't remember it. Get back on drugs, you fat jumping G hopes are fat. Get back on drugs, you fat prick. Thank you very much. I can see you're a poetry crowd. Or otherwise, why would you be in this tent? And if you're not, you've only got yourself to blame. So what I'm going to say to you is, don't bother pointing out that schmuck don't rhyme with prick. I didn't get where I am today not noting the phonetic dissimilarities between the words schmuck and prick. But you see what I did there? I subverted the form in order to point up a higher truth. <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> While we're on a philosophical bent, wherever I go I'm asked a lot of questions. What is occasional furniture the rest of the time? <laughs> Why only one monopolist commission? <laughs> if Jesus was Jewish, why the Spanish name? <laughs> How deep would the sea be if there weren't any sponges there? <laughs> and so... But I'll level you, whenever I'm asked any question at all, and I often am, I always answer in the existential. Why? Because I'll level with you. I'm an existentialist. Most of my friends are existentialists, but it's company for me. So whenever I'm asked any question at all, I answer in the existential. It's only natural, knee-jerk reaction. Pavlovian, <laughs> if you will. I turn into a meringue. Not really. I was trying to be flipped. 
But I'm an existentialist, so I always answer in the existential, whatever the question. Here's the question I'm always asked, invariably, wherever I go. Dr. Clark, how did you get here? I answer in the existential. Why ask? My mother and father loved each other very much. They went courting, then they got engaged. Then they got married. One thing led to another. Nature took its course and here I am. Why ask? Same as anybody else. Ah, oh, there you go again, Dr. Clark. Off on your existentialist tangent once more, when really, when we posited the question, how did you get here? We merely wish to ascertain what method of transport you went <laughs> Why didn't you say so? In that case, in the best kind of car known to men, and that car is, no, not a ladder. The difference between a ladder and a sheep, it's marginally less embarrassing being discovered getting out the back of a sheep. <laughs> the difference between a ladder and a Jehovah's Witness, you can shut the door on a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> Excuse me, OCD. <laughs> I'll go into it later if you want. <laughs> However, the best kind of car really, seriously folks, the best kind of car is obviously a higher car. <laughs> For these very reasons, these are the social advantages inherent in a rented vehicle as itemized herein. Double park, don't lock the door, push the pedals through the floor, give it loads and then some more, it's a higher car, baby. Grip the stick, grind the gears, watch that distance disappear, never be yours in a thousand years. It's a higher car, baby. Higher car, higher car, why would anybody buy a car? Bang it, bang it, say ta, ta It's a higher car, baby. Bad behaviour on the street, save yourself a couple of sheets, collision waiver, keep it sweet. It's a higher car, show this part of no respect. But, <coughs> excuse me, bump it, dump it, can't collect. What else did the firm expect? It's a higher car, baby. Higher car, higher car. Why hot wire a car whenever you require a car? Hire a car, baby. Drive the motherfucker anywhere just like you don't care. Put it down the wear and tear. It's a higher car, baby. Pray the person who hired it last. Did not drive it quite this fast. This dagger and dodging will not last. It's a higher car. Show this belt of no respect. Bump it, dump it, can't collect. What else did the firm expect? It's a higher car, baby. Higher Higher car, higher car, steaming like a samovar from the front bumper to the spoiler bar. Higher car, baby, try not to kill yourself or injure anybody else. Don't forget to fasten your belts. Rinse it, dent it, bang it, bang it, bump it, dump it, scorch it, sorch it, crash it, burn it, don't return it. Lost deposit, <laughs> let them earn it, who cares, it's on the firm, it's a higher car, baby. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sometimes less is more though, isn't it? But these long rambly poetical sagas are all very well, but sometimes less is more. Unless you're Phil Spector, in which case more is always more. <laughs> Apart from uh, Phil, he's got his problems, but you can't unlove those records. It's pretty bad shooting a chick through the brain, but it's not, it's not as bad as fucking children. <laughs> nice to see I've got some support for the change. Only in Glastonbury. <laughs> So sometimes less is more. For instance, everybody loves a limerick. Five lines. You go all over the world, everybody knows what they are. It's a five line point with a filthy payoff. 
Here's one, a traditional one. There was a man in Belgrave, found a dead hooker in a cave. Says it's, dis says it's disgusting, it only needs dusting, and look at the money I'll save. <laughs> Here's another one that I've picked a lot of holes in over the years on, on, on inspecting it. It goes like this. And I'll be playing there in a few weeks, so I'm going to ask them about how true could this be. I'm going to Holland very shortly to the low country. And uh, it goes like this. A woman in Amsterdam went for a ride on a tram. She cheated the conductor who turned round and fucked her. Now she's pushing a tram. <laughs> well, you can clap, but think about it. Think about it. Trams in Amsterdam are very rarely empty. It's a very popular mode of transport, so if the conductor fucks one of the passengers, it's not going to go unnoticed. And I know they're a bit free and easy on the continent, but that's not the point. Can you imagine the scenario? You've got two people going to work though, that doesn't happen every day. <laughs> going on, what's that all about? I think she cheated him. Oh. It's, you know, it's not very, you know, don't cheat the guy. I'm not, I'm not advocating cheating the conductor. <laughs> Nothing could be further from the truth. But is fucking her an appropriate punishment? <laughs> Especially given the consequences that will affect her life. <laughs> I'd say that qualifies as cruel and unusual. <laughs> Maybe I've thought about this five-liner longer than is healthy. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is sometimes in the world of poetry, less is more. Minimalism. It's a big thing in poetry. Here's one I made up. Limericks. Less is more, right? Two ugly sisters from Fordham took a walk one day out of boredom. On the way back, a sex maniac jumped out of a bush and ignored her. <laughs> See, you're proving my point. You're proving my point right there. Sometimes less is more. <laughs> I embraced the minimalist lifestyle 15 years ago. I acquired a book of beatnik poetry. It could happen. And uh, it featured the work of lesser known beatnik writers like the great Jim Carroll, Ed Dorn, and uh, Gary Snyder, the head of the Haiku Society. More about that in a minute. So thanks to him, I embraced the minimalist lifestyle years before any of you people. <laughs> you people were still living in cluttered dives <laughs> when I was embracing minimalism. <laughs> it's been a long road. I got it down to a George Foreman grill <laughs> and a bottle of disinfectant. <laughs> And that's when I realised I've got to get so I've got with the with the zeal of the recent convert, I've gone over the top. I talked to Michael Stipe, Gary Snyder, both interested in the road of the haiku and the way of Zen, like me. And uh, and they said, Jesus, Johnny, you know, you're gonna get some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what, you've never seen that movie? No, well, I haven't got a television. <laughs> you know, they're thinking, you know, you're getting to be bad company, you've got to start getting some shit. <laughs> 
So now a kind of acquisitive panic has set in, <laughs> but that threatens to spill over into mere kleptomania. <laughs> and I don't want to be here when the police arrive. So I've got to start getting some stuff. But in the poetry side of things, I'm still a minimalist, because I still believe that sometimes in poetry, or in, as in all art, less is more. Here's an instance. This is a two-liner. Now, I'm a minimalist, but I'm also a rhymer. There's lots of poets around, they don't bother rhyming. They could do a one-liner, but I can't do that. Because <laughs> I rhyme shit. So how can I rhyme the second line when there isn't even a first line there in the first place already? <laughs> you see my problem with this? So as a minimalist poet, I can't get less than two lines. This one's a hot topic. You can't usually accuse me of being topical. That's not what I do. Topical. I'm still getting worked up about the Dreyfus case. <laughs> But here's a point where I did actually get accidentally topical. I wrote this two-liner in search of minimalism and I actually uh, hit a raw spot with the BBC. Now this is why, you know, although this is only gonna... They pay by the line, the BBC. <laughs> and this would only have cost them 40 pence. <laughs> but they're not gonna use it. Why? Because it's about a touchy subject at the BBC. Let me level you in. My relationship with the BBC is this. I hate them. <laughs> I need them. I need them. No, it's not finished there. It's a bit more complex than that. I'm sure Mark Radcliffe and Lauren Laverne would agree with me. I hate them. <laughs> I need them. <laughs> For this I gave up heroin. <laughs> Stop the change. <laughs> Situation normal. Anyway, here's one that Roger McGough won't be using on poetry, please, even though it's the cheapest poem he's ever had his eyes on. <laughs> And this, but why? Because this one concerns aberrant sex. Touchy subject to the BBC. <laughs> aberrant sex. And I call this one necrophilia. <laughs> Fed up with foreplay and all that palaver. <laughs> Abacadabra. <laughs> And with minimalism in mind, I'm going to give you a selection of my haikus. Remember the haiku society of which Gary Snyder is the chairman? I'm going to keep doing haikus as long as Toshiro Mifune is alive. But I have to think long and hard. Let me explain what a haiku is. It's a kind of poetry that was pioneered in the 17th century in Japan by a guy called Basho who wrote for the Floating World Monastery. It's a poem of a 17 syllable discipline. Three lines, 17 syllables. First line five, second line seven, third line five. No deviation. You know, you know what the Japanese are like. <laughs> There's no Japanese translation for the term near enough. <laughs> I had to think long and hard before embarking on the road of Zen and the haiku. I thought half a syllable each way and that's going to be like spitting on my ancestors and then I'll be obliged to commit, you know, rituals, eviscerate myself in a public place. And I don't want that to happen. So I had to think long and hard. And I thought, well, that spitting on your ancestors. Push comes to shove. I could live with it. <laughs> spitting on my ancestors is what I do best. 
but the old evisceration. Forget about it. So I thought, get it right, Clark. The haiku. I'm going to mix them up. I'm going to give you a little, a little mashup of haikus here. Seventeen syllables, three lines, five, seven, five. But I'm going to mix them up. I'm not going to do them in chronological order because life ain't like that. <laughs> So I'm going to start off with haiku number two. Count them. I don't care. My life's an open book. <laughs> haiku number two. With patience and faith, you may catch your enemy's funeral cortege. <laughs> Save it up, give it me in a lump sum at the end. <laughs> I'll leave these moments as a contemplation aid. <laughs> Haiku at number six. Smarter men than I have been total idiots and I've met them all. <laughs> Haiku number five. Inertia saves lives. Idle threats remain that way. Procrastinated. <laughs> Haiku number four. Count them. With its golden pledge of a pain-free existence, morphine makes me brave. <laughs> Haiku number three. The way to relax. Don't lift anything heavy <laughs> and try to keep still. <laughs> Haiku number one, let's wrap this whole area up. Haiku number one, the one that got me started on the road of Zen. This and Gary Schneider. Check him out, beat Nick Supremo. Haiku number one. To freeze the moments in 17 syllables is very difficult. <laughs> okay, we're heading for the Essex section. Anybody here from Essex? Yeah? Yeah, lovely. Here. Thank God for that. <laughs> Finally, I can drop this fucking Liam Gallagher accent. <laughs> it was becoming such a fucking strain. <laughs> this one's about my next door neighbour, that one. Cyril Hornchurch. Solid gold geezer. That. Listen carefully. I love this man. I love this man. <laughs> Only a two up, two down. He turned into a little palace. <laughs> Solid old geezer. Thanks. Now wait a minute. I'm, no, I'm not going to start with that one. <laughs> Actually, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. I'm not a cunt. <laughs> Here's a romantic number. This one's called The Hanging Gardens of Basildon. <laughs> the bluebirds sang our favourite tune. That scented summer's afternoon when the shadows vanish and the flowers swoon. It's her sweet smile what dazzled them. The boy the hanging gardens that dazzled them. So long, Charlene, see your shell. I'm strong in it with an Essex girl. One of the several wonders of the world. Turn left at Basildon. Try the hanging gardens of Basildon. The redwood forest is a bunch of sticks. The wall of China's a pile of bricks. The pyramids mean less than nicks. 
It's the A13 I travel on to the Hanging Gardens. I beg your pardon. I said the Hanging Gardens. A Barden Barden. No! <laughs> the Hanging Gardens of Hazelden. Thank you very much. Okay, while well, we're in the corner, here it is, as promised a minute ago. Solid gold, keys of X, and this is for my friend, Master Goldsmith of Ken, actually, Mr. Stephen Webster. And this one's his birthday poem. I hope you like it. But I originally wrote it for Cyril Orne Church, who lives next door, but one from me. <laughs> Solid gold geezer, that. Solid gold geezer, that. Got a girl in a million, plus that. She wears her hair in a platinum plait, keeps it underneath a Fabergé hat, kissed him on the mouth and spat. Solid gold geezer, that. Solid gold geezer, that. From the solid hairpin through the mink cravat to the snake eye studs in his kid suede spats. Solid gold geezer that, solid gold geezer that, lives in a solid gold flat, sunshine slants through golden slats and can't find anything mat. Solid gold geezer that, frees the shy of any snack pack, what you want to get fat, wipe your feet on the way out Jack, he's happy you can't argue with that, brass plat says fat. Solid old geezer that, self-made aristocrats, life a Riley down pat, get so fabulous bingo tat, and a caviar guzzling cat, home is where he's at, just him, uh, and that little ball of fur. Solid old geezer that. Essex crowd. We're massive. We're just me then again. We're massive. It is no cord, it's a cordless. I didn't even realise it was a cordless. I can work out and do a gig at the same fucking time, man. Oh yeah. Keep it on that uh, The pains and muscles I had imagined had earthed by a long since atrophied. Do you want me to have some new shows? Here, I'll tell you what, I'll do one from the back catalogue. I didn't mean that to sound as gay as it did. Oi! I happen I'll be satisfied later, Ned Leather. Some Luddites invaded sight. <laughs> All right, let's... Slow me! This one, do you remember this one? Beasley Street. Yeah. Yeah. Up bricks a thousand miles long and a thousand miles wide. Across the wide misery. That's what it's like. Shannon knows I was in a You know this song, don't you? You're in a class from the crowd. You rolling river. Don't know this one, you know? I thought you were rocking up with me. Shannon I can't get near you. Oh, wait. 
I'm bound to go cross the wide Missouri. Yeah. I can't get me like it. Oh, hey, thank you very much. Shall I know I want to hear? Oh, hey, I'm bound to go across the water. God's country. Far from it. And this next one, this one's about my old hometown, Manchester. Well, it's anywhere in the world. To be honest, yeah, man. Well, this is this is for anybody. I, I, I took this thing. I circumnavigated the globe nine times, reading this number all the way. And somewhere, somehow, law of averages, some motherfucker knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I'm talking Cambodia, baby. This one's called Beasley Street, like that. <laughs> Far from crazy pavements, crack the sound of empty rooms, a clinical arrangement, a dirty afternoon, where the fatal germs of Mr. Freud are rendered obsolete, the legal term is null and void in the case of Beasley Street. In the cheap seats where murder breeds, somebody is out of breath, slumped to sleep as luxury, they don't need a sneak preview of death. Deadly nightshade is your flower, man, slaughter your meat. Spend a year and a couple of hours in the edge of Beasley Street In a boarding house and a bed sits full of accidents and fleas Somebody gets it when a missing person's freeze Wearing dead men's overcoats, you can't see their feet This red joint shirts opens up right down on Beasley Street Cars collide, colours clash, disaster and this stuff For the man with a few men, chew moustache, revenge is not enough There's a dead canary on a swivel seat, there's a rainbow in the road Meanwhile on Beasley Street, silence is the moan, it's hot beneath the and inspector calls. The perish instinct of squalor impregnates the walls. The rats have all got rickets. They spit through broken teeth. A blood stain is your ticket. One way down Beasley Street. The hipster and his hair cut. Drive a borrowed car. It looks like the Duke of Edinburgh, but not so loud. He dar. OAP mother to be watched that three piece sweep. When shine catcher drains and crocodile skis are seen on Beasley Street. The kingdom of the blind. A one eyed man is king. Beauty problems are even. Find the doorbells do not ring like bulls burst like blisters it's the only form of heat where the fella sells his sister down the middle of Beasley Street the boys are on the wagon the girls are on the shelf their common problem is that they're not someone else the dirt blows out the dust blows in you can't keep it neat it's a fully furnished dust bin 16 Beasley Street people turn to poison quick as lager turns to piss sweethearts are physically sick every time they kiss it's a sociologist paradox and it's each day repeats on easy, cheesy, greasy, queasy, beastly, beastly street. Hey, thanks a lot. Well, I went back to that area. I revisit that area, you know why? Because like that. I, I have like right hawks my bitch and she says like right you gotta look after your ends like right so like right well, I went back to my ends and I like right I checked it and you wouldn't know the place <laughs> you wouldn't know where the place we went back there with uh, some money from Urban Splash Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, <laughs> couple of lifestyle gurus, and now you wouldn't know the place. You want to hear about the makeover? Sure you do. Sure you do. And this one's written in exactly the same tune as the last one, for your ease and convenience, <laughs> in order to give you a historical perspective. Like this. Low slung shady bass. Sorry, that's pretty loud. Was that loud? Yeah. Oh. 
I've got wax in my ear, I wash my hair, that's a new thing. <laughs> and now I've got something in there that's like, the only time where I can hear normal is on a plane. <laughs> So was that a bit loud? All right, here we go with the revisit. Revisit. Written in exactly the same tune as the last one for your ease and convenience for a historical perspective like this. Loose, long, shady basement, gas rooms of empty sound, strip ribbon casements with Venetians halfway down. It's the Hoxton Finn with a nervous trim and a fragrant disregard. Urban splash out, ghetto gym, Beasley Boulevard, slates, glutted, sated, hunger has no home. Pampered preen, patinated in a multicultural kind of tone. Looking good, lose the hood or lose your loyalty card. Here comes the neighborhood now, Beasley Boulevard. About noodle bars, poodle parlors, studio bronze ask. Somebody saw the Prince of Charles in an Alfred E. Newman mask. Anything could happen, but it hardly ever does. There's a pub, but the regulars are bad. Nobody there to house your buzz down. Beasley Boulevard, the Mal, the Mall, whatever you want to call it, serves that glittering horde with choice enticements. Wall to wall, attracted then ignored. You want a shop where you don't need a cop and nobody swipes your card for a fair deal and a bit on top. It's Beasley Boulevard, there's the fat man's gross and the fox outfit of the drunkard's licensee. That guy who's given everyone the jitters who's never been on TV. Never been on TV, you say, how very avant-garde. And black and white turns pink and grey down Beasley Boulevard, a stringent disinfectant with a most intrusive sense, wreaking violence on any one of an olfactorial bent. While health and safety, the Beth did. The guys from Scotland Yard keep the area free from St. Beasley Boulevard. Top of the range, raging, change, long gone, overdue. The cops are gone, it's pale and strange with a whole new kind of view. Slightly better than paradise if you don't look too hard. Made over nice and nice. A B&B &B you wouldn't be without the BBC. Did a DVD about BB King. Did a thing in here about a garden of Eden in every yard. A phone box clear of hookers, cards, they to promenade on cheesy wheezy easy peasy Beasley Boulevard will cost a measly a million easily a Beasley Boulevard <laughs> Oh yeah, they did that motherfucker up to death. Here's a new one. You want to hear my newest number? Sure you do. Actually, it ain't the first time it's been out, but everybody's digging it, especially up north. I'm di rediscovering my, my roots. I'm rediscovering my roots up north there. And, uh, and with that in mind, I've written this from the point of view of a magical realism type olden. Why did I do that? Why did I take that approach? I'll tell you why, it's simple. I've never been to olden. So this is set in an imaginary olden. You ever heard that saying, uh, trouble at the mill? Trouble at mill. Ever heard of that one? Yeah. Aye, trouble at mill. <laughs> Luddites. So Luddites are on the march. There's always been an hard castle at hard castle's mill. <laughs> and by hell, there always will be. <laughs> See where I'm coming from? Trouble at mill. It's a common saying up in the north of England. So I'm rediscovering my roots here, but I brought it up to date. How? Now it's called Trouble at Mal. <laughs> See, I like to think I'm still in the groove with the modern world. And this poem proves that I am. <laughs> I've got to adopt a kind of, you know, North 
how I say on accent here, it's not even Manchester. We don't talk like this in Manchester. We're a cosmopolitan western facing port. We had soul music when the Rolling Stones were in kindergarten. <laughs> not being funny, I love the Stones, don't get me wrong. They took it somewhere else, but you know, it's a western facing mercantile port. We've always had access to the best music and American literature. Not blowing, I'm not blowing the flag for Manchester, why would I? I'm from Essex. <laughs> Totally impartial about it. Anyway, here we are then. Trouble at. We're in the modern world. Trouble at. <laughs> Apostrophe. Mal. Trouble at Mal. See what you think. Daily Bugle, front page news. A drunken posse on a booze cruise. Swear me in, I got nothing to lose. High five, low morale. Trouble eye, trouble eye. Trouble at Mal. I heard about it at the Taj Mahal. I nearly choked on me Tsarkadal. I quizzed a copper and he says, well, I reckon it's trouble, I trouble at Mal. Tripe stand bloody fell over. <laughs> yeah, that's my favourite line. Of the I agree with you. I agree with you. That's the best line I ever wrote. The reason I stopped is because I want to say it again. What level of catastrophe is that? <laughs> Tripe stand bloody fell over. It's come at the place in a beefy odour. Better take a nosegay, pal. Trouble eye, trouble eye, trouble at mouth. Bury my heart at Clinton cards. Remember me to the old guard. These days you just gotta be hard. Because like they say in this here old cow, trouble eye, trouble eye, trouble at mouth. H&M is full of flunkies and Tony and Guy couldn't give a monkeys. In the dying words of the late Gore Vidal. That makes trouble eye, trouble at mouth. I wrote the songs, all right, I've got a request from over there, but I'm going to carry on anyway. <laughs> you want that one? Yeah! All right, I'm here to please, yeah. Fuck you, man. You're the governor. <laughs> this one's called, uh, let me put this in some kind of perspective here. Um, this one used to, used to be called, uh, well, let me start from the beginning, right? The one that got me started on this was, I, I'm usually writing two poems at the same time. Put it out! And uh, I was writing this one about Burnley. <laughs> I know there's some people here from Barnsley, but don't go making that mistake, people. There's a lot of people, they go to Burnley believing that was the birthplace of Michael Parkinson, but that's not true. Actually, it's Barnsley. That is the birthplace of the great man. Ready? Let me save you some bus food. <laughs> if I can help somebody as I go on my way, then my living will not have been in vain. <laughs> so I say to you, save your money, go to Barnsley. Burnley, don't make my mistake. I used to, I was, I once did a gig in Burnley and my manager said to me, he said to me, Johnny, what are you doing doing shows in Burnley? A sophisticated gentleman like you. What are you doing doing shows in Burnley or anywhere else where they still point at aeroplanes? <laughs> I went ahead with it. I went ahead with it, that's how smart I am. Uh, it's just like he said it would be. 
Can I win this waiting room, Nicole? I met this guy there, he was his own father. <laughs> you can laugh, but he was the town intellectual. He dis discovered the art of breathing with his mouth shut. So just to illustrate the point a bit further about the kind of town Burnley is like, this couple, couple, they get married in Burnley. You can tell it's a Burnley marriage. They're all on the same side of the church. They go ahead with it. They go ahead. They're on the wedding night there, they checked into the Mullen Royal Hotel, Clitheroe, not rubbish. She says, here, I've got a confession to make, I'm a virgin. He says, you wait, panics. He pulls on the complimentary salmon pink bathrobe, drops down into, into the foyer, he gets on the phone home to his, uh, boom, whoever. <laughs> his dad answers. Hey Dad, what am I going to do? She just confessed to being a virgin. Pack your suitcase and come straight home. And she's not good enough for her family. She's not. The censorship. <laughs> I knew it happened soon or later. A lot of people don't like what I've got to say. I could concoct a, 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 a cogent conspiracy theory around it, but how long have you got? I blame the ant men who live on the dark side of the moon. They're invading this place next Jew, next July. They're invading this place. And I for one welcome our exoskeletal overlords. And as a public figure, could prove useful to them in, in recruiting fresh slaves to toil in their underground sugar caves. <laughs> Where were we with this? <laughs> what do you mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Burnley, fuck me, yeah. yeah. Anyway, he gets on the phone to his dad, she's a virgin, pack your suitcase and come straight home. If she's not good enough for her family, she's not good enough for ours. <laughs> no thanks to technology. That one would have gone down a bomb if it hadn't have been for the Thor police. <laughs> All right, here's a new one. Want another new one? Yeah. Sure you do. And this one, uh, this one killed him in Vegas three weeks ago. I hope you like it. It's called The Title Appears on the end of each subsequent verse with monotonous regularity. <laughs> with a controversialist in the chair and a woman who's been known to swear, they really try to not care when some cunt use the N-word Rolling news don't ever sleep. I saw this terrorist weep. What could have got to that creep? Some cunt used the N word. Motherfucker called some other fucker. All kinds of cocksucker. Everything was pucker. Then some cunt used the N word. A prominent politician deemed an unrepentant sex fiend. That footage never got screened. Some cunt used the N word. I tried to warn you fervently of a matter of some urgency. I can't remember the emergency because some cunt used the N word. Some, some knuckle dragging provincial bore. You know, one of the undeserving poor. Well, shut the front door. Some cunt used the N word. The heated debate done got too hot. Any rational argument went to pop. Look like, you know what? Some cunt used the N word. You better pray. You better pray. Nature never gets its way. I'll tell you why, but not today. Some cunt used the N word. Costumes by Mr. Tough. Cocktails by Molly. 
bullets off, cough up all bets are off, some can't use the n-word, who said it and what for, to even go there is against the law, even so one thing's for sure, Mr. White supremacist weep no more, cause some cunt spluttered, some cunt muttered, some cunt in chain store schmutter, some cunt from the fucking gutter, some nutter had the nerve to utter, well just to cut a long story short, well some cunt use the n-word. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to finish up now with... Well, I'm not finishing up now. I'm not finishing up. Don't panic. Don't worry about me. Relax. Have a glass of cream, son. Sheesh. We love you. We love you. Listen. A lot of you ladies, here's one for the ladies. I think you got a completely different impression of, of me of the one that I want to give out. <laughs> well, let me talk about that. Let me talk about, listen, uh, my marital career has been long and pointless. <laughs> Semi-pointless, actually. I'm very happily married now. Very nice of you to ask. <laughs> but then, generally, over the years, my marital career has been long and pointless, to the point where the last time I got divorced, I, I said to internal dialogue, I thought, uh, I'm not going to get married again, I'm just going to find a chick I don't like and give her everything. <laughs> <laughs> Cut out the middle. Why should I uh, uh, support the entire legal profession? It's not like they've ever done me any favours. <laughs> but no, uh, let, me, uh, let me get to the bigot. Somebody once said that a wedding is a funeral where you can smell your own flowers. <laughs> well, that's a harsh judgement in my favour, in, in my uh, view. I prefer to see it as a sexual relationship that is recognised by the police. That's a nice description. It didn't work out for me the first time, I'll be honest with you. I should have known it wouldn't work out on my wedding day when the registrar said, do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife, etc. I said, would you? He said, no. I said, well, what are you trying to palm her off on me for? <laughs> I went ahead with it, I didn't listen, even though we were like chalk and cheese. Apart from that, we had nothing in common at all. <laughs> I don't know whether you hold any great store by astrology, me neither. I thought it was a bunch of bullshit, but I had to rethink the whole event with my first wife, because uh, the point is, I'm an Aquarian, and she's an arsehole. <laughs> to rethink the whole way. <laughs> but I don't want to go putting anybody off marriage. There might be some young gentleman out there this evening thinking about making the legal move with his beloved in the not too distant future. I don't want to be the guy that pisses over his chicks romantic-wise. <laughs> because they've done extensive surveys on the subjects of marriage and they found out that guys that don't get married die before guys that do get married. Married men live longer than their bachelor friends. But it doesn't end there. But it doesn't end there. That's a scientific fact, but it doesn't end there. Guys who do get married, although they live longer than their bachelor peers, they invariably die before their wives. You know why that is, eh? Because they want to. <laughs> I can't believe this. Don't believe the answer to it. 
Anyway, as usual, as is common, a failed marriage led to a successful divorce. We split the house. I got the outside. Traditional. But I want to put you off marriage. But if there's anybody, any young man out there thinking about them making that move, here's a little bit of advice. Never get on that woman's nerves. They hate that when you get on their nerves. They can't stand it. It'll come up 25 years later in a conversation where you might not think it's appropriate. That time you got on her nerves. But if you really piss them off, well then you get the silent treatment. So it's worth putting in that little bit of extra effort. Enough already with the lifestyle advice anyway. Uh, I couldn't be happier now. I couldn't be happier now and it's largely thanks to my, entirely thanks to my wife. And this one's called actually, I've fallen in love with my wife. One for the ladies. The doorbell used to say ding dong, but now it voices out in a song. If I'm forlorn, it ain't for long. Could I be wrong, or have I fallen in love with my wife? Fare thee well, my fairy fee, we cared so slightly anyway. Call me crazy with a capital K. I've fallen in love with my wife. I've fallen in love with my wife. She populates my days. She, with my little breakdown running rife, I have to keep her under my gaze. You love somebody, set them free. That don't make no sense to me. I'm keeping her under lock and key. I've fallen in love with my wife. Rainbows and butterflies occupy the summer skies. Imagine my surprise. I've fallen in love with my wife. I've fallen in love with my wife. She populates my days. It's keeping me awake at night. My head stuck in this funky smeeze. Every time I talk, I mumble. Every time I walk, I stumble. I'm dancing like a drunken uncle. I've fallen in love with my wife. I've fallen in love with my wife. She populates my days. She's not that far from a carving knife. I have to keep her under my gaze. <laughs> I don't swear, but what the hey, I'm alright and she's okay, get out of our fucking way, I've fallen in love with my wife, I'm her fella, she's my mate, she steals the french fries off of my plate, no wonder I'm losing weight, I've fallen in love with my wife, I steal a kiss, she takes the piss, we live the life of ignorant bliss, all that and now this, I've fallen in love with my wife. work to do. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm a living man. Yeah, thanks for hanging around so long. There must be so much more uh, entertainment available here. So, I'll tell you, it gets me right here, ladies and gentlemen. I never felt so much love in one tent. Well, yeah, that's what I'm going to do, my friend. Yeah, you, well, you got it. In. You, you, you nailed it there. Yeah, I'm going to go out with this one. How could I not? This one featured on the uh, back credits of the penultimate episode of The Sopranos. I'm so happy about this. I'm a mean guy. I'm a mean guy over here. I don't even want to do the poem. I want to eat a nice sandwich. Have a glass of cream soda. Take a glass of milk. Do some fucking thing. I'm busting my ass over here. Hey! Shut up, you mouth! 
Me and him's gonna bust you in the low banza. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> let us read for you. <laughs> this number. I love to do this number in a live situation. On a counter, I'm not allowed to do it on BBC television. Not since the first time I attempted to do it on BBC television in 1978. Back then, England was a far more uh, censorious country. These days, somebody can call the Queen a cunt. <laughs> and next Thursday, they'll get a knighthood. <clears throat> it wasn't always like this. In fact, when I attempted to do this on the BBC television, the bleep operators, those guys that take out the dirty words, well, they sued for repetitive screening. <laughs> Wu-Tang Clan won't touch my stuff, man. <laughs> I love to do this one in a live situation on account of my swear box doubles as a high-yield pension scheme. <laughs> That's the truth of it. I need all the help I can get. Thanks for listening this evening, ladies and gentlemen. As requested, this one's called. I'll be Chicken salmon. The fucking cops are fucking keep the fucking keep it fucking clean the fucking cheats the fucking swine who fucking draws the fucking line of fucking fun and fucking games the fucking scummy fucking blames I know where to be fucking found anywhere in chicken town the fucking train is fucking late you're fucking waiting fucking wait fucking lost fucking found stuck in fucking chicken town the fucking scene is fucking sad the fucking news is fucking bad the fucking weed is fucking surf the fucking speed is fucking surf the fucking jokes are fucking depths don't make me fucking laugh it fucking hurts you fucking down anywhere in chicken town the fucking train Train is fucking where I fucking lost a fucking found stuck in fucking chicken sound. The fucking view is fucking vile for fucking miles and fucking miles. Fucking babies fucking cry. The fucking flowers fucking die. The fucking food is fucking muck. The fucking drains are fucking fuck. The color scheme is fucking brown. Everywhere in chicken sound. The fucking train is fucking like you dragging weight. You dragging weight. Fucking lost fucking found stuck in fucking chicken sound. The fucking pots are fucking dull. The fucking clubs are fucking full of fucking girls with fucking guys with fucking murder in their eyes, a fucking bloke gets fucking stabbed, waiting for a fucking kebab, you fucking stay at fucking home, the fucking neighbours fucking moan, keep the fucking racket down, fucking chicken sound, they're fucking running, Stuck in fucking chicken town. The fucking fish are fucking old. The fucking chips are fucking cold. The fucking beer is fucking flat. The fucking flats are fucking rats. The fucking clocks are fucking wrong. The fucking days are fucking long. It fucking gets you fucking down. Have it on the chicken town. Hey, say hello. Well, you know, people, thanks a lot. Thanks, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want you to go away from here thinking I'm some whole other body. You know, people say to me all the time, Dr. Clark, do you consider yourself a romantic? You know what I say to them? To a sadistic degree. <laughs> and this poem proves it. This is the poem that dragged me for the second time to the top of the album charts in the best-selling album of 2014, courtesy of my friend and blood brother, Mr. Alex Turner, on the album AM by Arctic Monkeys. I can't help feeling responsible in that I supplied the main party of the lyrics, but Alex, with his pr prodigious me mezzo-baritone, which should, you know, 
in, it, it, it should astound anybody who ever listens to it. What a wonderful singer. And I couldn't have been happier when he converted this uh, heartfelt Valentine poem into a, a tender love ballad by not doing very much. And that's all down to the musical genius of uh, Mr. Alex Turner, ladies and gentlemen. I can't thank that kid enough. I love that guy. My wife thinks he's my illegitimate son. We, we, he's got a big Uber. <laughs> I used to look like that. The years have not been coming. <laughs> no, but really, this one's uh, this one proves that I'm a romantic beatnik number one. I hope you like it, ladies. You know what it is. This one's called. I want to be yours exactly like this. Intimate connection now. Let me be your vacuum cleaner breathing in your dust. Let me be your Morris Marina. I will never rust. If you like your coffee hot, let me be your coffee pot. You call a shot. I want to be yours. Let me be your raincoat for those frequent rainy days. Let me be that dream boat when you want to sail away. Let me be your teddy bear and take me with you anywhere. I don't care. I want to be yours. Let me be your electric meter. I will never run out. Let me be the electric heater. You get pneumonia without. Let me be your setting lotion, drip your skull with deep devotion, deep as the deep Atlantic Ocean. That's how deep is my devotion. A deep, 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 deep. I don't want to be hers, I want to be yours. Hey. Self-privileged, sensational stuff by Joker. Now I recommend.